So when we are younger, we live a very carefree life. The biggest concerns of children most of the time are related to what they will play with or who has their toy at the moment, or whether or not they can have dessert with every single meal. However, as we ride the roller coaster of life with its ups and downs, and as our responsibilities begin to increase, so does our day-to-day -day worries. It can be overwhelming at times, and many of us have watched other people worry themselves sick, and some people never recover. So I thought that making a video like this would be important and could potentially help someone. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jack, and thanks for joining me on this video. The inspiration for this video actually came to me after reading this book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. And it was suggested by a friend of mine and I went and checked it out. It's just full of so much fantastic advice. I essentially went through the book, I read it twice, took notes, and will present to you the highlights of it and what I thought were the most important. However, if you're interested in the book, and I would suggest you pick up the book and give it a good read, I'll link it below uh, so that you can check it out for yourself. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. Worry. We all do it. So much more than others and some are able to shrug it off and not let it bother them. While with others, the worry can consume them, making them miserable in life. This worry has been shown to not only impact their emotional and mental well-being, but it directly impacts their physical health as well. It's sort of like the Chinese water torture method. And for those of you that don't know, the Chinese water torture, essentially what they do is slowly drip water on top of someone's head and over a period of time, and some studies have shown that as quickly as within 20 hours, you can have sort of a psychotic breakdown from just water dripping on your head. However, Mythbusters did do a video on it and they thought they busted the myth, but the flaw in their study apparently was that they would drip the water on someone's head at a slow and constant rate. And when you do that, the brain can adapt to that. So what they found was that if you actually drip the water in unexpected rates, that someone can have a psychotic breakdown within 20 hours. And that's very similar to worry in life, right? And where you're going about life and you just don't know when something's gonna happen to you. It's very unpredictable. And so it does lead to sort of a lot of angst and anxiety and hence the point of this video and the point of this book is to basically go over various strategies and suggestions on how to combat this. The great philosopher Plato has been quoted in saying that physicians actually need to concentrate on the patient's mind as much if not more than their actual physical ailment. It's been known that excessive worry can cause things like high blood pressure leading to heart disease, as well as insomnia, which can lead to all sorts of health problems if you're not getting a good night's rest, and things like inflammatory bowel syndrome, and ultimately can lead to, an, to a weakened immune system and put you at risk for reactivation of things like chickenpox and the result of shingles. It also matters as to how you end up coping with worry. Some people cope with worry by overeating, and obviously this can lead to things like diabetes and morbid obesity, and this will cause an entire cascade of health issues and chronic pain. And it can also lead to significant fatigue. So when you're worrying and you're emotional and you carry a lot of tension, they're typically the biggest causes of fatigue for many people and we don't even notice it. I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you've had a quote unquote bad day with a lot of stress, ultimately you sometimes feel like you just wanna lay down due to the fatigue. Oftentimes we contribute this fatigue to physical exhaustion. You see, when we're tense and we're stressed, all our muscles are actually tense as well. And we may not realize it, a tense muscle is a working muscle. Take the example of an office worker who is behind on a project and needs to meet a deadline and they're working long and stressful hours, and then when they go home, they're extremely fatigued. They actually complain of feeling physically exhausted. Well, mental work does not necessarily cause this. You see, the brain is an organ that actually makes up only 2% of the body weight, and it burns 20% of energy, so it's a bit of an energy hog. However, it stays consistent no matter what you're doing in regards to the amount of energy that it burns. The brain actually burns more energy at rest than a thigh muscle while you're running. Knowing all this, why are we so exhausted when we're stressed out? It's the tension in your muscles as well as your body essentially working harder when we're stressed and worrying. So when you're stressed and worrying, it can lead to higher blood pressure, you're breathing harder. All this leads to exhaustion when we're just seemingly sitting there. So it's important to do sort of a tension check where you kind of sit back, close your eyes, and perhaps have a mantra 
where you tell yourself to relax or say wusa or you know sing the frozen theme of let it go and just feel the muscles from your head to toe relax you can even do an exercise where you slowly flex each muscle and then relax them and if you do this and do this at certain intervals you'll likely be more productive and less exhausted in the long run so now let's begin with the various tips and advice that the book suggests and kind of work through the highlights of it all. And we have to start with your thoughts. Marcus Aurelius in a fantastic book called Meditations has a quote where he says, our life is what our thoughts make it. And Ralph Emerson has a quote where he states that a man is what he thinks about all day long. How could he possibly be anything else? So therefore, if we think happy thoughts, then we tend to be happy. If we, sit, if we think sad thoughts, we tend to be sad. If we think of failure, then we're most likely to fail. And if you're fearing failure, well, then sometimes we have failed already before we've ever tried to do something in life. And all of that plays out in our head. There is this great saying by Norman Vincent Poole where he states that you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. And it's important to realize that there is a difference between being concerned and being worried. When someone is concerned, they're more likely to have identified a problem and therefore more likely to take steps to actually fix that problem if it's fixable. However, when we're worried, our thoughts tend to go round and round in sort of futile circles inside of our head and create all of these sort of unnecessary physical aspects for us as well as mentioned before. There was a French philosopher who was quoted in saying that a person is not so much hurt by what happens as by his opinion of what happens. And the amazing thing is that opinion is entirely up to us. We can choose how to actually view any situation that happens to us in life. And Confucius has a famous saying where he states that to be wronged or robbed is nothing unless we choose to remember it. So in this mindset, it's also important to focus on things like count your blessings and not your troubles. And what this means is to essentially keep life in perspective. And in the book, they give this fantastic story about this gentleman who he lost his job and he was about to become homeless and all sorts of troubles had befallen him all at one time. And he has this fantastic saying at the end where he states, I had the blues because I had no shoes until upon the street I met a man who had no feet. So it's human nature to take for granted what we already have in life and not really appreciate it and to focus on what we actually lack or what's missing in our life. However, if we take a moment and take a step back and view things beyond our bubble that we live in, we begin to see that we're all wealthy beyond our wildest imagination. If someone were to walk up to you and say, offer you a billion dollars for your eyesight, would you sell your eyes for a billion dollars and go blind for the rest of your life? If not, for your eyes then what about for your arms or your legs or for your family your children and when we begin to look at things in a different type of perspective especially in regards to these types of matters we begin to see that you most likely would not sell these things for all the money in the world the next piece of advice is to live in airtight compartments and what this means is to live each day until bedtime and to concentrate only on that particular day and to realize that today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. It's important to take a second and analyze the facts and your history of these worries. In general, most people gather facts to justify their actions or preconceived notions. Uh, there's actually a term for this called confirmation bias. We don't wanna do that. What you wanna to try to do is basically gather the facts and look at them objectively. Half the worry is actually due to people trying to make decisions without all of the facts. And it's important to try and pretend that you are someone that's just gathering information for someone else so that you remain objective. And then you want to analyze the facts. Pretend that you are a lawyer analyzing evidence to present them to a courtroom. Then you will approach it with an analytical mind. And then ultimately, arrive at a decision and then act on it. So basically what you're doing is you're trying to identify what are you worried about, what are the circumstances, and what can you do about it? And the ability to ultimately arrive at a decision is invaluable because oftentimes the majority of the worry is due to the fact that we cannot arrive at a decision. And then once you've made the decision based on whatever facts are presented to you at the time, then it's important to run with it and not look back. Don't second guess yourself and just commit yourself to doing what you can 
to solve the problem that's causing the worry if there's something that you can do about it. That is unless new information gets presented and it profoundly changes what you should or should not do in that particular circumstance. And it's important to realize that as you're gathering more and more information that it's not always helpful. At some point, the more information you gather, it doesn't really change the ultimate decision and can actually create more worry as opposed to lessening the worry that you may have. And within the book, they talk about this law that will outlaw many of your worries and that law being that 99% of what you worry about typically will not come to pass. And what they're talking about there is basically for you to take a step back and look at your record. Look at the history of all the things that you've worried about before and ask yourself how much of that ever actually came into fruition and actually played out the way that you expected. And you'll begin to realize that a lot of what you worried about before was completely needless because none of it ever came to pass. So examine your life record and keep it all within perspective. So let's say that you arrive at a conclusion and you figured out that nothing you do is going to make a difference. What then? Well, that's when you must cooperate with the inevitable. And what does this mean? There is an inscription on the ruins of a 15th century cathedral in Amsterdam. And on it, it says, it is so, it cannot be otherwise. See, in life, we will encounter lots of unpleasant situations that are just going to happen to us. And there's really nothing that we can do about it. We don't have a say in these matters. Life will just always happen. However, we do have a choice. And your choices are to basically, number one, accept them as inevitable and adjust as well as adapt accordingly. Or the other choice is to not accept it, even though there's nothing that we can do about it, and let it ruin our lives and cause things like depression and frustration, the why me phenomenon of why does this have to happen to me, and worry ourselves into sickness and possibly into a nervous breakdown and basically turning us into a completely miserable human being. While doing all of this, it absolutely does not affect the final outcome. And by no means are we saying that you should not fight in any type of situation or adversity or anything that causes you to worry extremely. By all means, if something can be done about the situation, then do something. However, when common sense tells us that anything that we do really isn't going to change the situation, then it's important to change the way that we are thinking about the situation. There is this great Mother Goose rhyme where it goes, for every ailment under the sun, there is a remedy or there is none. If there be one, try to find it. If there be none, never mind it. And the book mentions this really good other saying, and it goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Focus on breaking the worrying habit before it breaks you. So, there you are, you've got this completely unwelcome situation that's causing you a ton of worry and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like a comet heading for the earth and you're basically stuck there. What do you do to keep from worrying? Well, one thing you can do is to keep busy and you can keep busy perhaps by helping others or focusing on others. Consider keeping busy by forgetting about yourself and becoming more interested in other people. And every day, try to focus on a good deed that will put a smile on someone else's face and make their lives just a little bit easier or pleasant. Benjamin Franklin has a saying that goes, when you are good to others, your best to yourself. And doing such rich, selfless acts is also a great way to battle depression because it's hard to worry if you're busy. Winston Churchill has a saying where someone asked him how he keeps from not worrying about situations and he states that, I'm too busy. I have no time for worry. And the scientist Pasteur spoke of the peace that's found in libraries and laboratories. And he goes on to talk about why is peace found there? It's because people in libraries and laboratories are usually too absorbed in tasks to truly worry about themselves. People that are heavily invested in learning and research rarely have time for these types of nervous breakdowns. They haven't the time for such luxuries. And so why does this work? Well, it's because any human mind, no matter how brilliant, can only think of one thing at a time. If you don't believe this, try this. The book gives you this task to do, and they ask you to close your eyes and to think of the Statue of Liberty. And also, try to think about what you need to do tomorrow. Now, you can do this simultaneously, and you can do it now. Close your eyes and try to do both of these. However, we find that it is impossible to think about both these matters at one time. It's impossible 
to feel fired up to accomplish a goal or learn something new or just to be preoccupied and at the same time be dragged down by worrisome issues. One emotion drives out the other. And it was common during World War II when army doctors used to tell soldiers shaken by battle fatigue and various things like that, that the biggest suggestion that they had for them was to keep everybody busy. And I'm sure all of us have experienced this at some point already where the hours after work at the, or at the end of your day when you're laying down or when you have a moment of quietness, they are actually the most dangerous ones. Uh, just when we are free to enjoy our own leisure and we should be happy, you begin to have all these negative thoughts and emotions such as worry, fear, hate, jealousy, envy. They rush into the vacuum of our brain and these emotions are so strong that they drive out our happy, peaceful thoughts. Okay, so that wraps up this series and basically hitting the highlights on this fantastic book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. Again, I highly suggest you check it out. It will be linked below in the description. It's a read that you really won't regret doing. And ultimately, if you take a step back and look at what this book is talking about, it's mainly just trying to help you live a healthier psychological and in return also a physical health as well. And it's really just hitting on coping mechanism. And it's so important. Some could argue that it's the most important aspect of who you are and how you've arrived at wherever you are in life. Because if you think about it, for whatever reason, you have chosen to deal with certain situations in a certain manner. And those are all your coping mechanisms going into action. Some people, for whatever reason, are, pre are presented with adversity and difficult situations in life. And they have chose to dealt with them one way and others have chose to dealt with them a different way. And either way, those decisions have really shaped who you become and where you ultimately arrive at in life. So I think it's important to continue to read books like this and ultimately do this sort of introspection. And so I hope you found a lot of value in this video and I hope it will help you in some way in regards to identifying worry, seeing which worry you can actually do something about it, how to analyze it, and how to move beyond it and sort of pivot or change your thinking so that it will not cause you such physical harm as well as psychological or emotional discomfort. So I hope you guys found this valuable. As always, please feel free to share this video with others. Hit the like button, subscribe if you're not subscribed. And until the next video, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Pura Vida.